Hi everyone, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Today we're doing the second video about the two new inbox Amiga 500s that I found at a warehouse liquidation auction. Somebody had mentioned the computer warehouse liquidation auction in Dallas recently. No, this was from a different auction. It was on the east coast of the US and they just had a lot of miscellaneous, a little bit of everything. So, Anyhow, that's where it came from. I just got lucky and happened to find it. So I spent the last few days among my other tasks, finishing up some other things, reading through the Amiga 500 manual about, oh, I don't know, a third of the way. So I have an idea of how to boot it up and use it, uh, at least the basics. And I think we're going to start out uh, looking at the first A500 by making sure the power supply is okay. Now this is something sometimes people... Uh, bypass in their haste to look at a new machine because you know turning on the computer itself is fun but a bad power supply can really ruin your day and it can really ruin your equipment so we'll take a look at how to test a power supply both uh, visual inspection and testing it electrically to make sure it's okay to power your equipment let's get started here we have the power supply from the first machine and this little sticker I put on here just to write any notes I want to keep with the unit temporarily it is the type that's not permanent it's sort of like sticky note or post-it note type adhesive so I can peel that right off of there and I like to start out with a visual inspection uh, it's probably not as necessary on something that's new in box like this as you know just a random use thing because you don't know if somebody's spilled some liquid in there or it's had you know rodents in it or bugs in it that might have caused a problem and fortunately this power supply makes it easy because it just has four screws holding it together this is the same size case as the 128 power supplies and if you've ever held one of them you know how bloody heavy they are and this is very light in comparison the other similarity is they use this square den plug, but don't plug one into the other or you'll blow the machine and or power supply up. They are completely different voltages. Okay. Okay, looks like all these screws are the same length. That's good. There we go. And there's, there's our fourth screw. Okay, this looks like it's in pretty good shape. I don't see any wet spots or corrosion. The capacitors look good. I don't even think I'm going to pull the bottom of the board out. Well, no. Um, there's nothing really unusual in here to look at. I'll get you a closer look. Well, okay, we'll pull the board out. tricky thing is here the power switch is kind of soldered in place but I think we can get the board wiggled out of here enough to have a, a peek at it maybe maybe not yep yeah, there we go okay so here is the bottom of the board yeah there's nothing Particularly noteworthy here, other than some botched on small uh, capacitors. You can see the mess they made with some hand soldering. Here's the board number, in case we can't see it when it gets put back together. DSP-A500 Rev2. DVE0388. The other advantage of doing the visual inspection ahead of time like this is we don't have to worry about the capacitors on the high voltage side being charged up. 
Here is a close-up of the power supply. Nothing fantastic there, just a run-of-the-mill Amiga 500 power supply. You can see that little notch on the bottom of the screw. This is one of them that holds it, the circuit board into the case. This is a thread cutting screw. So especially on these, but really on all screws that are going into plastic. A nice thing to do is to start it about one turn backwards and listen. So well, it's hard to hear on this, but it gives the screw a chance to drop into the existing threads rather than cutting new threads started. Oh, that one, you might have been able to hear it pop into the threads. I've got these all started and snug. And then I'll tighten them. I'll slip our strainer leaves back in place. There we go. That one was being a little cantankerous. Okay. Make sure we don't have any wires over our mounting post here. And it's got to go this way. Okay. Evidently, you can have the strainer leaves 90 degrees out and the cover won't go on tight. So, there we go. I'm going to go ahead and start the screws on this because I don't expect anything's going to go wrong with the power supply. And if anything does happen to go wrong and it blows up, it's shielded. Okay, we've got it back together. Now, the tricky thing is trying to put your meter leads into something like this is you can short it against the shield, you can short them together, and that's not normally a good thing. And then you also need to know what's what. Now, they were nice on this one and put a pin out on here for us so they're numbered and they list what the voltages are. And whenever you see a pin out like this, you always have to ask yourself, well, is that the pin out of the plug? When you're looking at it like this, is it a pin out of the connector on the computer? Is it a pin out of the plug looking at the back side of it, like if you're soldering that up? Now, since this is on the power supply itself and you can't get to the back of this plug, my guess is it'll be from the front of the plug like that. And if you look up pinouts online, you'll often just get a picture, you know, something like this, and it'll say, you know, here's the pinout, and you don't know if that's the pinout looking at the power supply plug, if it's the pinout looking at the front of the plug, the back of the plug, the front of the connector on the computer, or the back of the plug on the computer. So you have to use a little um, common sense if you don't know in determining that. You know, we know that these two pins are going to be 5 volts, and since there's a notch here, I can measure across these two pins and get 5 volts, whereas if I measure across here and here, I might get 12 volts or nothing or something silly. So once I determine if this is 5 volts, I know that's ground, and then I should be able to measure 12 volts to there and minus 12 volts to there. I drew this up really fast just as a note to myself. This isn't to scale, but it shows the computer view. If you're looking at the outside of the computer, that's that view, and this is looking at the front of the plug like that. So I've got my map here. The other thing is, we talked about you know just a second ago, is how to make a good reliable connection to this without shortening anything out. And you can slip some heat shrink tubing over your multimeter probe and slip that down over the, the pin. You still got to hold it in the right place, but that works. And you know, it's basically free. You may have some uh, female terminals around that will fit over there, which is what I had here. These are female pins from a Molex uh, mini fit connector, and I just crimped them on some wires here of different colors. This is just what I had in my junk box. And slip some heat shrink tubing up over them like that, and then these will plug right onto there and I can test it and I tend the other ends of the wire so I can connect the alligator clips to the meter. Here is our test setup. We've got our Amiga 500 power supply hiding back here. 
got a voltmeter. And if you've seen my uh, one of the first few videos I did on the Commodore 64 power supply testing, this is the little dummy load I made to test Commodore 64 power supply. So I'm just reusing it in this application. It's just some power resistors. Uh, you can do the same thing with like automotive light bulbs. Uh, this will just put up to an amp and a half load on the 5 volts. So I've taken the, the test lead I made and plugged it into the proper pins there. I put on my diagram what wire colors I used. And on the meter here, I've got the red lead going back here to this alligator clip. This other alligator clip is running over to provide to send the 5 volts to the dummy load. The ground here is going to the other side of the the dummy load for the for the ground, and then I've got the meter negative lead here. I put the meter positive lead here, so after I test the five volts, I can check the uh, plus and minus twelve volts. With these switches both down, there's no load on here, so we'll go ahead and turn the power supply on. It comes up at just over 5 volts. Now, some people get a little concerned when this is showing over 5 volts. That is perfectly fine. It's always designed to be slightly higher to account for the loss in the lead and as it's going into the computer through the switch and the filter in the computer, things like that. We'll turn on part of the load. You can see it dropped just a little bit under load, but it's perfectly fine. And We'll give it the 4 full one and a half amps and it's dropped down to five volts. We'll just leave it like that for a little while. And while it's under load, we're going to test the yellow wire, which is the minus 12. I have minus 12.34. That's fine. On the plus 12, we have 11.92. Now on five volts, you usually want, uh, depending on the equipment, the 5 volts to be within, say, 5% or maybe 10%. Again, that depends on the equipment. So let's say, you know, the 5 volts would be maybe 4.8 volts to 5.2 volts would be a you know, perfectly acceptable range or even a little higher. On this 12 volt, you know, plus and minus 12 volt, that's usually not as critical. So you'll see it from, you know, 11.8 volts, you know. In, the, in that range, 11.6 volts, that's perfectly fine. So this power supply is doing fine. Our dummy load's heating up. And if you guys would like to know more about building a dummy load for testing power supplies, just let me know and we'll do an episode on that. Now I'm happy that this power supply is functioning properly. So uh, we'll go ahead and take down our test setup here and get our first Omega 500 over here and crack it open. It's been just as it is now since it was made 30 some years ago. Well, here we've got our A500 on the bench finally to crack it open and have a look at it. We'll do that. We'll give it a quick visual inspection to make sure everything looks okay. And then we'll actually power it up and see if it still works. Let's get started. Okay, well, I've got my work mat here, so I don't have to worry about scratching it. And this has torque screws, like the 64Cs did, and they did kind of a wonky job putting the sticker on it. It's not centered, but I guess that's the way it was. That's the way we'll live it, and we're, or the way we'll leave it, we'll live with it. And uh, we'll have to break the warranty seal here, but, you know, I don't think Commodore is still going to honor the warranty after all these years. Okay, and the first time... Oh, kind of surprised how much of a lip there is here on front. My little pliers here to pull these screws out. First time I take something apart, I like to set the screws out in the order. I take them out of the machine just to make sure that I know what length everything is. Sometimes you'll get one screw that's just a little bit longer and then you're kind of stuck when you're putting it back together because you don't know which hole it went in. Okay, all three of the front are the same length. I'll spin it around here. I'm
Okay, all six of them are the same. So I believe now we should be able to rotate this cover off of here. Wow, it's interesting. The return key almost has a shiny appearance. Well, I guess it's all the keys of this color. They have quite a shiny appearance to them. Okay, trying to feel for any catches in this. There we go. Well, cover is off of there. How exciting. Oh, the keyboard looks fine. It's not dirty. That should slip out of there. And we have ground wire attached. Oh, you know what? That that actually unplugs, but we've got it unscrewed now. So, keyboard unplugs from there. And it's got one pin that's keyed, so we can't plug it in wrong, theoretically. Well, there's not a plug in here, it looks like. There's just no wire there. Okay. So our keyboard looks just fine. This is made in Malaysia. We'll set the keyboard aside. I'm gonna go ahead and reconnect this grounding lug. Helped of it. Okay, and we've got one, two, three. Three more torque screws and some tabs on here. These look like they're the same length as the outside case screws, which is very convenient. I really like it when the engineers think ahead. It not only makes production easier because they only need one box of screws and they can't get it messed up, but it makes servicing it a lot easier too. I know some people are in the habit of not putting these RF shields back in. I'm inclined to disagree with that sentiment because they were put in here for a purpose. If they hadn't been needed, they wouldn't have spent the money putting them in there. There's also the idea that uh, the FCC requirements were worse back in the day, and actually the opposite is true. They're much more stringent today because the electromagnetic bandwidth is a lot busier. The board looks perfect. I'll get you a close-up of this. Wow. The floppy drive says past burn-in in Westchester. Yes, that's Westchester, Pennsylvania. We've got the Fat Agnes, the Paula, Denise, the Odd CIA, Even CIA. All the capacitors look just fine, no leaking. We actually have footprints on here to bump this up from 512k to 1 meg. And now um, I'm inclined to do that at some point. Maybe not right away, but tell me what you think. Should I leave these exactly original? Maybe leave one original and uh, bump this up to one meg. But leave this as it is and just go with an extension on the side. So let me know what you think. Got our 68,000 here. The ROM. So go ahead and give all these socketed chips a push. Since they haven't been through any heating and cooling cycles, I wouldn't expect them to walk out of there too much. And the badge on this board says B52 Rock Lobster A500 Rev Rev 6A. Everything looks really nice. Wow, this is such a treat. 
This is just like getting a brand new one 30 years ago. It's so shiny. Okay, I'll get you a close-up view of this. Okay, here's some handheld shaky cam. I'll do as good a job as I can. Doing a flyby of the board condition. So I guess in this day and age, this is as close to factory fresh as we're ever going to find. I've seen this botched in resistor on Gadget UK and Jan Beta's videos, so I know those are okay. Okay, this looks fine. So I'm not afraid to power this up. It's always a good idea on any piece of equipment that you get. Uh, whether it's new old stock like this or already been used to give it a quick visual inspection to make sure everything looks okay before firing it up and then maybe damaging something so we'll get the cover put back on this and get it fired up for the first time ever let's see what it does can't wait okay let's go ahead and put this back together now Got our super shiny shield. Okay, here's something I didn't pay attention to. This is the cover for the expansion slot. And it looks like it was, there's no screw marks on here from the screw head, but there is right here. So that tells me this was under that. So I think what I'll do is I'll get these tabs twisted back into place to provide some downward pressure. And I'll do these other two screws loosely. And then we'll slip this back under there and start those two screws. There's one little bit of tarnish right there. But that was from a fingerprint from back in the day. Okay, we've got all our tabs bent back over. Nope, that screw is trying to run away. It's like it was finally free after 30 years and it didn't want to go back. Oops, that's a torque screw. Okay. And since this is covering that expansion port, it makes sense that it would be like this, because if it was like that, it would short out on that card edge connector, which still looks perfectly clean. Okay, do I will just slip that under there. There we go. Okay. I guess the trick here is getting all those holes lined up. No, I think I was wrong about that. I think this has to be on top. Yeah, because if that's under that piece, not only is it really difficult to put on there, but the holes won't line up. So that solves that mystery. Okay. See, no matter how careful you are, you can still Find yourself in a pickle the first time you take something apart. Okay. Slip our keyboard back in here. And it goes like this. There's a black dot on this connector and it looks like it goes that way. And then the missing wire lines up with the missing pin. So four wires on the left, three wires on the right. Okay, now this should just slip right on there. Okay, we got our keyboard slid back down in place. Get our wire here out of the way. 
guess we can put the cover back on. Kind of snaps like that. Okay. You know, I don't know if you can see how much of a, a lip there is from the top cover. There's probably, well, a millimeter and a half. But the top cover hangs over the front. Be curious if that's normal. No, we should be able to fire this thing up for the first time ever. Okay. Here is my slightly complicated test setup on the bench. It's got the A500, of course, power supply, the mouse. That's all pretty normal. Got this monitor back here, which has you know VGA and HDMI inputs, and an Xtron IN1502 video scaler. These are commercial units. Uh, they're slightly old technology now. You can find them on eBay for 25 to 50 bucks. They're slightly different models. This particular one has two inputs. It does composite and S video. So I use it for the Commodore 64. It works great for that. I think I paid you know, $30 or something for it. Now I've got my workbench disc. And this cable here is going to a video capture device. So I'm going to capture the video output here on my PC. So we're going from the Amiga composite and the stereo output to the Xtron, which is converting that to VGA to display on this monitor. We've got a VGA splitter that's up on the wall here, just to the left of the monitor. And the other output of the VGA splitter goes to the capture device. So that way we'll try to keep all the test uh, similar so we can you know see the difference i fear we'll start out first with just the the uh, grayscale uh, composite output you know from the a500 see how that works and we'll go from there so now if i have everything set up correctly this should work i haven't had this powered on yet this is the first time so we may have to mess around with the settings on the Xtron to see what happens. So, got the capture device capturing nothing right now. I'll flip on the power supply. I've got a green power LED. I've got something on the screen and I'm capturing that. Wow, that popped right up. There is the first time this thing has ever been on. How cool is that? Oh my gosh. That is super cool. And you know what I forgot to do? And I thought about it, putting this thing back together and I still forgot. I forgot to pop the little cardboard thing out of the floppy drive. So let's try to get that done. Oh, hey. Maybe I should have looked at that when I hit it. Oh, there's nothing in there. Interesting. In the directions, which I read last night, it said there would be a little cardboard protector in there. And there is nothing like that. So, didn't you guys tell me if they ever did put a, a cardboard protector in there like they did on the five and a quarter inch drives? I don't know. I don't remember ever seeing one on anything that I ever had that came with a three and a half inch floppy drive. So, that popped right in. Our orange drive. LED comes on. Somebody had commented about the color the LEDs would be. They are green for power and orange for drive. Oh, wow. Look at that. Oh, gosh. That is so cool. And this mouse is a really, really funky shape. Okay. There we go. How awesome is that? So... I like the little Z balloon up there instead of like that hourglass that you see now. I thought maybe there would be some demos on here. Okay. You know, for a grayscale,
composite output, this looks actually pretty decent. Let's see what's in the utilities drawer. I also found it interesting that the nomenclature they used in the manual calling everything gadgets and drawers and uh, things like that. I kind of went a little overboard with the gadget terminology. Now we just say, you know, buttons and things like that. Okay. And they went into exhaustive detail about how to use the notepad, but you know, still at this time, computers are relatively new. Okay, let's type on this keyboard for the first time ever. How awesome is that? Oh, it's just so awesome. This is the first time this ack. I can't type. Ack. Okay, awesome. Now, should be able to drag it here. And that closes it. Did not save my... Right. Well, it works. Oh, I'm so stoked. Okay, now we're going to change over to using the A520 and get some color output out of this thing. It should only take a few minutes. Shut off our power. Okay, well for a grayscale composite, I was pretty happy with that. Now this is the A500 video adapter. It's basically taking the analog RGB and it gives you a color composite video out and an RF out. I'm not even gonna try the RF out. I really don't care about it. But this was a very quick and easy way to get some uh, color video out. And we can compare that to the grayscale. And I just smashed a bug on this brand new thing that's never been used. How sad is that? Oh, there we go. Okay. The first bug worked out of the system ever. Okay, we're going to have to slide this out a little more. My workbench is a little crammed. Okay. Okay, there we go. Got the 520 in there. Kind of sticks out there a long way. Okay. So now we are all set back up. Uh, we've got the video output of the A520 now, so we should have color up on the screen. This is still just color composite, so we're taking the, the analog RGB signals here, converting them to composite, which is being converted back into... RGB again basically so we're going to lose a little in that double conversion process but it's a quick and easy way to get up and running and just test that this thing's working. Okay I've got my workbench disk out. Go ahead and turn on the power supply and it springs back to life. Oh we have some color now. Yay! Okay put in the disk. Okay that's not too bad for being composite. I mean, it's sure a heck of a lot better than the composite you get out of, you know, uh, Commodore 64 or something like that, isn't it? You can see the characters are a little blurry around the edges, but it's not too bad. Now, why this booting up? What do you all think about uh, storage options? I know some people fit Gotex into these, but I really don't want to cut on the case or do anything like that. Um, thinking about you know SD card options, I know that. Uh, there is an option for the side bay here where you get a uh, compact flash card usage and you can use an A1200 expansion uh, to get a faster processor. What uh, internal storage options are there? You know, I, I think uh, rather than trying to write floppy disk, uh, you know, download disk images and write floppy disk and use floppy disk, which I'm going to do anyhow just for old time's sake. But you know, maybe having uh, SD card stories or something like that, or even the compact flash would be better. Let me know what you think. Uh, really need some advice from all you longtime Amiga guys. This is my first ever Amiga. Okay, hey, we're booted back up. Let's open up that workbench again. You know, the text is a little blurry, but it's it's really pretty good. It's much better than I thought it might be. Uh, I see you've got to keep the right button down. That's a little inconvenient. I think go up and
release it there. That's a little Mac-esque, isn't it? All right. What do you say now that we got some color? I find that Tetris disc and we figure out how to play a little Tetris. First game ever played on this computer. How cool is that? Give me just a second. Okay. I found the Tetris disc. And although I have never played a game on an Amiga before, I suspect it's about like everything else. Double sided. You know, I went looking through my disc last night to see what uh, double sided, double density disc I might have on hand uh, that I can make backup workbench copies on. And I only wound up with a couple, and they're a little bit dirty, so I'll clean them up and see if they'll work. But I thought, you know, I'll see if somebody locally has some. And I put an ad on Facebook Marketplace, and I got a response uh, relatively quickly. And, you know, a guy said, oh, I think I have some. I'll look, which was nice. And then a short time later, Facebook blocked the ad and said, you know, it violated some terms of service, you know, due to guns or whatever, which was kind of funny. Uh, I just had a picture of a floppy disk on there, so I don't know what Facebook was thinking it was. But <laughs> Anyhow, I'll pop Tetris in there. And okay, it doesn't. This mouse is such a weird shape being high on the back like that. It's kind of makes me feel like I've got a claw hand. Okay, Tetris.x. I su suppose that means it's an executable. Okay, we can resize that guy there, although it's still just the one icon. And. This disk is mostly full. I like how they did that kind of gas gauge type thing there for the amount of disk space. That's a rather neat idea. Please replace workbench volume. Okay, in any drive. Oh, yay! Disk swapping. I've missed that so much in my life. Oh, yay, get to put Tetris back in. This reminds me of, you know, you would buy a big program or something and it would come on a dozen floppy disks and you'd have to put them all in to install it on your 30 megabyte hard drive. Ah. Oh. Now, you know, you just click on something online and it downloads a few gigabytes in no time. Ah, oh, workbench again. Good night. One eternity later. This really makes me wish I had an external drive. Oh, yay. Amiga Tetris. I bet it's going to ask for the actual Tetris disk again. Uh, unknown command music player. Tetris failed. Return code 999. Hmm. Well, Amiga experts, I'm going to have to look up what that means because I don't know. It's kind of funny you would think since these two things were packaged together, you know, this version of Workbench and this version of this Tetris. Tetris disc that they would work together. That's rather disappointing. I'm not sure what you do from the CLI. I know it's the command line interface. Exit maybe? Oh, workbench then. Huh. This return key doesn't seem to work. To only accepting this one. That's interesting. Okay, so, well, we've got the workbench disk in there. And we'll open up the utilities again. Nope, oh, it's still thinking. Gotta be patient. Well, 
there's our first actual factual problem. This return key does not work. So it just seems like the return key on here is the only thing that doesn't function. And Tetris won't run. So I guess that's not too bad. We can handle that. Uh, I think I'll wrap up this video here. We've got it working, and my camera battery's about dead. And in the next video, we'll take a look at the return key, and we'll get it working with a different Extron video scaler that has RGB input. I think that'll work. Until next time, bye. Oh, I almost forgot. Uh, if you're a subscriber, thanks. I really appreciate it. It helps out a lot. When people subscribe, it helps other people find the channel. That's the way the YouTube search thing works.